Welcome to our first ever Arizona Conference virtual camp meeting, Camp Meeting 2021. We're so glad for those who are here at our local venue, which I will not tell you where it's at. Uh, you're going to have to figure that on your own. Um, eventually, you're probably going to find out. But we are so glad for those of you joining us by a couple of venues. I want to talk about that first. There are four ways to watch Arizona Conference Camp Meeting 2021. One is mygoodnewstv.com. Now write that down, my, M-Y, good news, TV, the, the letters, TV, not television, tv.com. So that's the first place you can watch it. Second place you can watch it. Well, of course, Good News TV on channel 22.1 is not showing it live. So you're going to have to watch that on uh, mygoodnewstv.com. The other place is YouTube Live. And you just use the same name to get on on YouTube Live, uh, mygoodnewstv.com slash camp meeting. That's how you would get on uh, if you're going YouTube. And there's also Facebook. So we have a couple of ways for those of you who are viewing to watch Arizona Camp Meeting this year. And we're so excited about our camp meeting. We have great speakers. I'll introduce them a little late, later on. Great musicians and a wonderful program for you. We are thankful for the online opportunity to do camp meeting. Last year, the pandemic hit us right before uh, camp meeting. Well, not right before, but a month or two before camp meeting, and it was at its height just before camp meeting. So we had to pull the plug and cancel camp meeting. The only time, I think, in the history of the Arizona Conference they had to pull camp meeting. This year, we were not going to let that happen. Some of you know we had a drop-dead date of March 31st. If we were not able to meet in person, we were going to go to virtual. We are going to meet, definitely meet together. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank our team. There's a wonderful team. You'll be surprised how many people are involved in this program. I want to thank my dear friend Steve. I'll talk more about him later on. He's been our camp meeting superintendent for many years now. And he jumped right in there, even though he's like me, he's got an old head. He's not a virtual type person. And he jumped right in there and said, I'm going to help out. And, and uh, Carolina uh, Flores and Jackie Battistone have done a wonderful job helping. Good News TV and all of their crew, what a great job they've done. And if you heard the introduction music coming in, I still say Pat Francis Howard. Forgive me for using the whole name. But we want to thank Pat Francis for her beautiful music. And later on, I'll introduce Scott Michael Bennett, who sang for us at John Bradshaw's meetings we had in October of 2019. And, I'll have, and we have Dennis Marcillier, he's going to be our chorister. We have a wonderful, wonderful team for our program. I want to share with you one last thing before I get into, uh, before I exit the stage, and that is our theme is overcomers. There's a lot of things in life we'd like to overcome, but of course the main one is overcoming sin and living a life that brings glory and honor to Jesus. Our theme verse for camp meeting this year is Revelation 12, verse 11, which believe it or not, my dear friend Dan Gerard, our speaker for tonight, was the one who said this is a perfect verse to go with your theme. Here's what it says. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. May God bless Arizona Camp Meeting 2021. Let us begin with prayer as we open this uh, virtual camp meeting. So Heavenly Father, here we are, thanking you for the opportunity to come before you. In a few minutes, the Sabbath hours will be upon us, and we really, really need your blessing. This year has been very difficult for many of us. And so today, as we come before you and as we use every technology available to try to reach out so many homes, so many people, I pray that you will give us the blessing that we so much need. We are here to honor you. We are here to hear your voice. We are here to celebrate the goodness of the things that you have done in our lives 
and the ones that you have promised to still do. So, Father, tonight we ask a blessing upon the speaker, a blessing upon the musicians, a blessing upon every home who will be watching us. Again, may we honor your name as we celebrate, as we fellowship, as we find refuge in you tonight, tomorrow, and then into next week. So, Father, thank you again for blessing us today as we open this virtual camp meeting here at the Arizona Camp Conference. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to be here in the virtual camp meeting. I invite you to join us in singing this wonderful hymn, O Glorious Victory That Overcomes the World, Faith is the Victory. Sing along with us. Thank you for leading us in that beautiful song. Uh, Dennis Marcellier has led the camp meeting anthem choir for the entire 18 years I've been in Arizona, and we are truly thankful for his ministry and the ministry of all of those who have participated over the years. In fact, if you watched our promo vi video that Dennis Kamberg put together with Good News TV, uh, Dennis is on there, and, he, and we had a good shout of my secretary, Jackie, and her husband, David, as well, from singing in that choir. So thank you. It is my privilege tonight to introduce our musician, our guest musician for this first weekend, Scott and Michael Bennett. Scott was with us, as I mentioned already, for the... Um, uh, Hope for the Valley. I was trying to think of the name of Hope for the Valley, our uh, 
special evangelistic effort we did in October of 2019. And what a wonderful job he did. We just loved listening to it. And being a part of that program, walking around the auditorium and helping with different things. I was kind of a gopher, helping with greeting and security and doing different things at at that uh, special event, it was great to hear Michael's voice, Scott Michael's voice just echoing through those halls. Scott Michael Bennett is an international recording artist with a vibrant music career spanning over 20 years. And he's only 25 years old, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> He is currently the affiliate musician for It Is Written Television and has also helped on Hope TV, Amazing Facts, 3ABN, Safe TV, and the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Scott travels the United States full time in a tour bus with his wife, Heather, and his two little girls, Emma and Aubrey. Wow, that's special to be with your young ones all the time. Well, God bless you, Scott Michael, as you lead us to heaven in music tonight.
Amen. Thank you again, Scott. That was beautiful. And I'm sure there are a lot of people at home saying amen as they are watching us on YouTube and Facebook and MyGoodNewsTV.com. And I want to make a quick announcement for those of you who are watching. You can chat. We have two pastors, uh, Dr. Tony Jasper and Dr. Jonathan Smith at their home churches in Prescott and Tucson, who are keeping a track of the chats and will be sharing those with us so we could share those with you as well. So we encourage you to chat on the My Good News TV line so that we can share with you these wonderful uh, statements that you have or something that you want to share. Maybe it's just an amen that God has been good to you. So uh, make sure you put those in there. Now, it's my privilege tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dan Gerard. Dan became a Christian at the age of 15 in a Pentecostal denomination near his hometown in Augusta, Georgia. What Dan doesn't realize, my brother was born in Augusta, Georgia. And he accepted God's call to ministry that same year. Now, I don't know how many people have been called to ministry at 15 years old, maybe some, but he knew it. He served for 18 years in ministry through uh, the Pentecostal churches, serving as a revivalist, an evangelist, a pastor, an administrator, and a Bible college professor. Dan earned his Bachelor of Theology degree from a Pentecostal seminary and then his Master's of Theology and Doctorate degrees from Baptist seminaries. Now, I like to tell people, because I was raised Baptist, my mother was Methodist, that I'm a Methabaptist Adventist. So Dan is a Methabaptist Pentecostal Adventist. <laughs> so we thank the Lord for his wide range of study because he can understand some things that you and I may not be able to. In 1982, after spending 10 years intensely studying the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in order to prove the church to be a cult, he came to accept the unique teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to be biblical, and he was baptized along with his wife, Rebecca, in Keene, Texas. Since then, Dan has served in several places. We worked together in New Jersey, and he served most recently serving as a revivalist in the Gulf States Conference with my good friend Dave Livermore, uh, who's the conference or was the conference president there until just recently. I am truly thankful for Dan. Dan has been a friend for a long time. However, we haven't played golf for about 13 years together, so that may have to change this weekend. I am truly thankful for the ministry he shares. I've heard him speak several times. He's spoken even for our pastors here in Arizona, and he gave a camp meeting, uh, a whole series of talks at camp meeting in New Jersey when I was there, and really touched my heart. Dan's written a number of books. What you may not know about Dan is he's, is it seven books now? Uh, quite a few books, and he has a real deep love for Jesus. And that's the most important thing we want to see in our speakers here at Arizona Camp Meeting. Dan, share with us God's Word tonight. And 
Sometimes the way is lonely and steep and filled with pain. So if your sky is dark and pours the rain, then cry to Jesus. fills the night and when you can't contain your joy inside final heartbeat you'll kiss the world goodbye then rest in peace and wait for glory's ride and then you'll fly to Jesus fly to Jesus fly to Jesus and you'll Thank you, Scott, for that beautiful presentation. I am excited about the opportunity of being here for this wonderful experience that God is allowing us to have in this place. I'm going to be sharing with you this evening a part of my testimony of how I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I tell people sometimes, you can argue with my doctrine but you can't argue with my testimony. Our testimony is our most powerful witness for the Lord. I want to read again our theme scripture from Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him, speaking of the enemy of God and the enemy of the human family. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. Father, we pause to thank you for what we've already experienced with you and one another during this time of worship together. And I thank you for the opportunity of sharing again how you have led in my life, how you have enabled me to be an overcomer through the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And so realizing the importance of what I'm about to share, I again offer myself as a vessel, afresh and anew into your hands at this very moment. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear Son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight, so that your purpose your design purpose might be accomplished for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective. Because as I pray and praises for victories I give in Christ's name, amen. I was born on December the 12th, 1948. But I was born again at the age of 15 in a small Pentecostal church outside my hometown of Augusta, Georgia. Shortly after that conversion experience, I began reading through the book of Psalms as part of my daily devotions. And when I came to Psalm 31, the Lord wrote indelibly in my mind and in my heart, verses 1, 2, and 3 of Psalm 31. 
In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. The closing words of verse 3 became a part of my daily prayer as a young lad of 15. For thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. You see, that was important because at that time in my life, I thought I knew what I was going to be when I grew up. I was going to be a professional baseball player. I envisioned my name in lights as I pitched one no-hitter after another, but God had other plans for me. Later that year, God called me to preach, and for several weeks I shared that with no one. Finally, one Sunday morning, I pulled my pastor aside and said, Pastor, God has called me to preach. And I'll never forget the expression that came across his face as he smiled and responded, He has, huh? We'll see about that. You're going to preach this coming Wednesday night. And so Sunday evening at church service, he announced that I was going to preach Wednesday. And I went home and began practicing and rehearsing what I was going to say, thinking with my first sermon, I was going to turn my part of the world upside down. Well, as a general rule, there were only a few folk present for Wednesday evening prayer meeting. But that night when we rounded the last curve and came in view of the church, there were cars everywhere. Went inside, it was wall-to-wall people. It seemed to me as though the entire city of Augusta, Georgia, had come out to hear this young 15-year-old boy preach. I sat on the front pew with our song service, our testimony service, our prayer service, and then the pastor announced that I was going to speak. I jerked to attention, walked up on the platform, took my place behind the pulpit, opened my Bible, lifted my head, and became petrified. My hands started to tremble, my knees started to shake, and it felt as though someone was pushing a large piece of cotton down my drying mouth. Well, that sermon that was to turn the world upside down wasn't a sermon at all. Wasn't a sermonette. Wasn't even a good talk. It lasted for a few seconds. I closed my Bible, walked off the platform, seated myself, very discouraged. As I was leaving the building that evening, an elderly gentleman I'd never seen before came up to me and asked, Son, may I share something with you? And I nodded. And he said, Son, if you had gone into the pulpit the way you came out of the pulpit, you would have come out of the pulpit the way you went into the pulpit. And I must confess to you that I did not understand what he was saying. But that night as I lay on my bed, it all made sense because I had gone into the pulpit with a great deal of confidence and I had come out with great humility. And he was saying if I had gone into the pulpit with more humility, I would have come out with more confidence. And so I learned a very valuable lesson that first encounter behind God's sacred desk, that being this. God's Word is not to be preached in my intellect. God's Word is not to be preached in my practicing and my rehearsing. God's Word must be delivered under the anointing power of God's sweet Holy Spirit. And I praise God for that first lesson learned. Well, that wasn't my first, last experience in preaching. Invitations started coming in, and I started traveling around. Graduated from high school and went to a Pentecostal Bible college in North Georgia, and then transferred to a Pentecostal seminary in Greenville, South Carolina, Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, Theological Seminary. Holmes was a very unique school. It started in 1898. It is the oldest continuing Pentecostal school of higher learning in existence. It put a lot of emphasis on rules and regulations. 
they had one rule that said there was to be no communication between members of the opposite sex who were single. The young men sat on one side of the classroom, young ladies on the other. Young men sat on one side of the dining room, young ladies on the other. Young men sat on one side of the church building, young ladies on the other, with the church members right down the center aisle. There would be no talking, no note passing, no prolonged glances. Now, this is not the dark ages I'm talking about. This is the late 1960s. Well, at that time in my life, I thought I knew what I needed to be a successful preacher. Believe it or not, I had quite a bit of hair then. Jet black, combed it straight back, had a little wave to it. And I thought, with my black wavy hair, if I just have a Botany 500 suit, Hickok belt, floor shine shoes, a white Cadillac with a black vinyl top, a wife who has blonde hair, and she can play the organ with one hand and the piano with the other hand. Watch out, Billy Graham, old Robert, Jimmy Swaggered. Here comes Danny Gerard. <laughs> Not too long after the school year started, we stood up as we did to give the young ladies the courtesy of leaving the classroom first. And I just happened to look across the room and my eyes fell on the face of the most beautiful female I'd ever seen in all of my life. And when I turned the next few days, there she was. And I wasn't purposely seeking her out. She was just there. And these feelings started welling up in my heart, and I knew what was happening. I was being attracted to her. Couldn't speak to her. Couldn't write her note. Better not even be caught looking in her direction, but there she was. Well, I fought against that for two and a half years because she did not, she did not match my idea of who and what my wife should be. First of all, she didn't have blonde hair, she had dark hair. And secondly, I discovered she could not play the organ or the piano, but I was falling in love with her. After two and a half years, I decided I needed to go visit with her uh, last year. Now, in order to go visit a young lady, either during the Christmas season or during the summer, we had to get permission from the president of the seminary. Well, for weeks, I worked up nerve to ask permission to go visit this young lady I had never spoken to before. Finally, my, my nerve was at the right level. I walked across the street, knocked on his door. He invited me into his study, seated himself behind his large desk, and on that desk was a small chihuahua dog. And that little chihuahua dog was barking and lunging at me, and, and I was becoming more petrified as the seconds passed. And finally, he said, well, Brother Gerard, what do you want? And with stammering lips, I said, Dr. Beecham, I would like your permission to go visit Miss Jenkins over the Christmas holidays. And when I said that, he leaned back in that large chair and he started to laugh. And I can close my eyes now and I can still see his ADO cheeks just bouncing up and down. And I'm wondering, why is this man laughing? Is my hair messed up? Is there something on my shirt? Why is this man laughing? Finally, after he had his fill of laughter, he leaned forward. There was a little glimmer in his eye. He said, well, Brother Gerard, there have been a couple of other fellows that have also asked to see Miss Jenkins over the Christmas holidays. I'm going to give you permission, and I want you fellows to fight it out. <laughs> well, I was kind of like that little chihuahua dog on his desk. Same height I am now, but I weighed less than 130 pounds, but I had a big bark. And so I found out who those other two fellows were. And in no uncertain terms, I told each of them, I don't want to see you near Wilson, North Carolina. I don't want to hear of you being near Wilson, North Carolina. I better be the only one to visit Rebecca Jean Jenkins this Christmas. 
Well, my bark paid off, and I was the only one to visit with her. Spent a few days of romantic encounter, and then being the bold, brazen young man I was then and still am today, I decided to go ahead and ask her to marry me. And I was going to do so in the most beautiful place in all of Wilson, North Carolina. Well, we got in my little Mustang, and we drove around, and there was no beautiful places in Wilson, North Carolina, Christmas of 1969. And I was about to give up, but as we were traveling back down the road toward her home, I saw that little Pentecostal church where she had been born and raised. And to me, that was the most beautiful place in all of Wilson, North Carolina. And so I wheeled my little Mustang onto the parking lot, walked around, opened the door, took her by the hand, walked up the steps, held both of her hands in mine, looked deep into her brown eyes, and asked, Rebecca, will you marry me? Well, I was expecting her to throw her arms around about me and yell, yes. But I had made her wait, and now it was my turn. And I stood there, and I stood there, and I stood there until finally she gave me a positive answer. Took her back to the girls' dormitory, the end of December, saw her every day for five and a half months, knew she was already making plans for our wedding in June, could not talk to her, could not write her a note, better not be caught looking in her direction. You talking about agony. I was in agony. We graduated at the end of May, and on June the 28th, 1970, after spending less than two weeks together, we were married in that little Pentecostal church in Wilson, North Carolina. In just a few days, we will celebrate our 51st wedding anniversary. And I love that girl more today than when we said, I do. You see, God will lead us, and God will guide us if we will just give him the opportunity. We can be more than conquerors. We can be overcomers. Well, 1970 was a good year for me. Not only did I graduate with my bachelor's degree in theology, not only did I marry the girl of my dreams and of my life, but I was ordained at the age of 21 into the gospel ministry. The next year, the denomination of which we were members opened its first Bible college. I was working on my master's degree at that time, and so they invited me to be one of the professors. I was to teach Greek and Old Testament and biblical theology. As that year was progressing, I felt as though God wanted me to learn something different than what I had been taught. There was a young man who came to visit our campus, and he found out who I was, and he approached me and offered to sell me all of his books. He had grown up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, but he had just recently become a Christian. Do you know that there's a difference between having your name on a church roll and your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? You know there's a difference, right? Well, this young man had grown up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, had just recently become a Christian, and he wanted to sell all of his books. He just wanted to study the Bible to find out if what he had been taught was biblical or not. I asked what he had. He told me he had a number of books by various authors, among whom was a lady by the name of Ellen G. White. When he mentioned Ellen G. White's name, something clicked in my mind. And I remembered that I had been taught in Bible college and seminary that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a part of the Christian community. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a cult. They did not believe in salvation through faith in the atoning blood of Christ. They believed in gnawing and clawing one's way into the kingdom of God by keeping the old, outdated law. And so I thought to myself, I'm going to buy these books. 
and I'm going to nail them to the wall. I'm going to crucify them. I'm going to reveal to the entire world who and what they're all about. And so I purchased the entire library from that young man, including a complete commentary set for the total sum of $20. We never saw him again. I have wondered on occasion what kind of personality he was. The next Sunday morning, I was on the way to a preaching appointment. I was turning the radio dial looking for some gospel music or some gospel preaching. And just as I pulled up into the churchyard, I heard a deep, resonant, rather compassionate voice as he was concluding his presentation for that Sunday morning. I can still hear those six words today. This is where we are today. That's all I heard him say. Somehow I knew that he must have been talking about Bible prophecy. The announcer came on and gave the name of the program. I did not get that because I was watching out for the car in front of me, didn't want to hit it in the rear, but I get, did get the address. He said that we would like more information to write to Post Office Box 55, Los Angeles, California. Monday morning, I sat down at my desk, wrote a note, where am I today? Put it in an envelope, sealed it, stamped it. Didn't put the name of the program, just post office box 55, Los Angeles, California. No zip code. Didn't know if I would ever hear anything. Lo and behold, a few weeks later, I received a whole stack of material from a place called the Voice of Prophecy, which I later learned was a Seventh-day Adventist media ministry. Unbeknowing to me, God was leading in my life like I never thought possible. Well, I started going through that material I purchased from that young man, quote, unquote, I started going through the lessons from the Voice of Prophecy, and something happened in my heart and mind. Every time I came to something new and different to me, placed it under the magnifying glass of God's Word, it always came out right. Across the pages of my notes, I started writing three words. It is written. <laughs> Not knowing that there was another Seventh-day Adventist media ministry by that very title. After several weeks, I started using that material to develop my lessons for that Pentecostal Bible college. Some of the professors and students started coming to me and asking, where are you getting that material? That's the best stuff we have ever heard. Where are you getting that material? And do you think I was about to tell them where I was getting that material? <laughs> Not on your life. I like my little paycheck. <laughs> in 1973, God led me back into the pastorate in North Georgia. I was visiting one day, and one of my members was in the hospital. I went to visit with him. And I was introduced to his roommate, who was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. His name is Woody Widden, Woodrow Widden, we call him Woody. And I thought to myself, I need to get to know this man because what I am discovering in their literature is biblical. But maybe over the years they have digressed and moved away from their printed page and maybe that's why they're called a cult. I need to get to know this man. Well, Woody was interested in studying the baptism of God's Holy Spirit. I was interested in studying Bible prophecy. I was about ready to start on my doctoral work at that time, and I had already determined that I was going to write my thesis, my dissertation on end time prophecy. And so periodically, Woody and I got together for prayer and Bible study. And to my amazement and delight, 
I discovered that Woody Whitten was a born-again Christian. He loved the same Jesus that I loved. He was part of the same family of God that I was a part of, and I learned to appreciate and love him as a brother in Christ. After several months, Woody called me one day and said, Dan, I just called to ask you to pray. He said, I'm leaving this area. I'm moving to New England. And I must confess to you that I was disappointed. I was upset. In fact, I was angry with God. I couldn't understand why God had led this man into my life, and I was learning so much from him, and now why God was leading him away from me. I couldn't understand that. Well, in 1974, I was finishing up my doctoral work, and so I thought to myself, self, I'm about to become a doctor of theology. I <laughs> what that means. I can now teach my church biblical end-time prophecy. And so I started a series of lectures on Wednesday evening on Daniel's 70 weeks. Everything went beautiful until we came to the 70th week of Daniel. But when I began to present the 70th week of Daniel in the biblical historical context, a bad spirit developed in that church, and I was asked to resign my pulpit because I was teaching false doctrine. What was I teaching? I was teaching there will be no secret rapture. I was teaching there will be no seven-year great tribulation period after a secret rapture. I was asked to resign my pulpit in shame and humiliation. I moved my wife and daughter, and we were expecting our second child at that time, back to my hometown of Augusta, Georgia. And I said, God, I will never preach again. I have given 10 years of my life to biblical study and research. I've given 10 years of my life to biblical proclamation. And this is how I'm treated? Never again, God, will you burn me like this. And for two years, I kept that vow. 1976, my wife and daughters were out shopping, and I was home alone. And I was sitting in my easy chair that Rebecca had purchased for me, and I began to reflect back over the past 12 years of my life. Some of it had been close to Jesus, but at that time I wasn't as close as I should have been. And as I sat there in meditation, the tears started rolling down my cheeks. My weeping became more and more forceful. My body began quivering in almost an uncontrollable fashion. And with all the strength and energy I had, I, I pushed myself up from the chair walked into my study where my small desk was located, and from that bottom drawer, I took out that doctoral dissertation on end-time prophecy. And as I held it in my hands, I looked at it and thought, if it wasn't for this paper, if it wasn't for my research, if it wasn't for my conclusion, if it wasn't for my willingness and eagerness to share my findings, I would still be active in gospel ministry today. And I began to tear. And I tore, and I tore, and I tore. When finally I could tear no finer, I wadded it as tight as I could, dropped it in the wastebasket, fell to the floor, began pounding and screaming at the top of my lungs, God, is there not a people? Is there not a people on the face of this earth who really want to hear what you have to say? God, is there not a people? After all that bitterness and anguish was released, God, through his sweet Holy Spirit, as only he can, whispered to my spirit, Son, just be patient. 
there's a few more lessons you need to learn. It's almost over. In just a few weeks, I was standing behind a pulpit again, and I was like a bird let out of a cage because until I die, a preacher am I. In just a few months, I will be celebrating 57 years of preaching, and it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. And I told my wife not too long ago, sweetheart, if I die before Jesus returns, I'd like to die behind a pulpit <laughs> or in your arms, one. 1981, we were pastoring in Texas, in Irving, Texas. Beautiful congregation there. But I got in trouble again because I wanted to preach and teach what I had discovered to be truth on end time prophecy. The board met and came to me and said, Pastor, we love you. We don't want you to leave. Just don't preach anymore on the subject. And I knew something was about to happen. My wife and I attended a conference in Oklahoma. And as we were driving back down to Irving, Texas, I told Rebecca, sweetheart, we need to pray. I don't know what Jesus wants me to do. Maybe I need to start my own church. Well, I won't have to worry about church boards. No offense to church boards. I won't have to worry about elders. No offense to elders. All I have to worry about is preaching the unadulterated Word of God. Sweetheart, we need to pray. I don't know what God wants me to do. November of that year, 1981, I was out visiting Came home, walked into our living room, and there were two strangers sitting on our sofa. Immediately, I recognized they were salesmen. But they weren't ordinary salesmen. They were what's called coal porters or literature evangelists of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church. They had been in the area. They were told that I was the local pastor. So they decided to stop in and pay a friendly visit. And when they walked into our living room on that piano, my wife never learned to play. Now, I did get her to dye her hair blonde one time. <laughs> and you will have to ask her when you see her if blondes have more fun. <laughs> But on that piano she never learned to play was a five-volume set of books called the Conflict of Ages series. And those Seventh-day Adventist literature evangelists immediately recognized them. And so they wanted to find out how this Pentecostal pastor had those Seventh-day Adventist books on public display on the piano in the Pentecostal parsonage he was living in rent-free. <laughs> and so I shared with them how at that time I had been studying the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for over 10 years. I had placed every teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church under the most powerful microscope my academia and spirituality would allow. And I could not prove them wrong. As they were getting ready to leave, right before they had prayer, I made this statement. That if I wasn't a Pentecostal pastor, I would probably be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Those two literature evangelists rose from their knees, taking me literally. They contacted the closest Seventh-day Adventist pastor. He called me a few days later and introduced himself as Pastor Renee Keesby and asked, when can we meet? And I opened my mouth to say, no, Pastor Keesby, I will not meet with you. You see, I still remember what God did with that other Adventist pastor. But to my utter amazement, when I opened my mouth to say no, it came out yes. <laughs> now, the only explanation I can, I can give is, I believe the Bible and all of the Bible. 
And the Bible says there is a gift of the Spirit called the gift of tongues. <laughs> and I just believe that when I open my mouth to say no, God knowing what I really needed, His sweet Spirit took control of my tongue and it came out yes. And when it did, I'm thinking to myself, you are a dummy. <laughs> Why did you say that? Well, we looked at our calendars. Thanksgiving was coming up. Christmas was coming up. And so we decided we could not meet until January, about two months later. On January the 21st, 1982, when Pastor Rene Keesby walked into my study of that Pentecostal church in Irving, Texas, it was like Woody Whitten, that other Adventist pastor, all over again. He didn't have to tell me he was a child of God. His spirit bear witness with my spirit that we were both part of the family of Heavenly Father. I discovered a real brother in Pastor Rene Keesby. Every few days he would come back to visit with me. And, and finally the discussion came around to doctrine. And as I began to share with him, as he asked me questions, it was kind of like his lower jaw was dropping a little lower and a little lower and a little lower. Because the answers I was giving him were answers that he had grown up with as a 70 Adventist youngster, and he had been teaching and preaching in his ministry. In April, Rene called me. He said, Dan, I've got good news and I've got bad news. He said, I'm leaving this area. I'm moving to Keene, Texas to be the senior pastor there. And I did not politely hang the receiver. I slammed it down. I stomped to my bedroom, flung the door closed, dropped to my knees, buried my head under the comforter and began screaming at the top of my lungs, God, you're doing it to me again. Why did you lead this man into my life? And now why are you taking him out of my life? God, you're doing it to me again. After all that bitterness and all that anguish was released, before I realized what was happening, my Pentecostal hands started raising toward the heavens. And I found myself praising God. Praising God for Pastor Renee Keys becoming into my life and, and praising God for Pastor Keys be going out of my life. And there was a peace that came over me like I had not known in a long time. And again, God's sweet spirit is only he can whispered, Son, just be patient. It's almost over. Renee called me a few days later and said, Dan, I know how interested you are in Christian education. He said, we have a nice college in Keene, Southwestern. Why don't you and your family just go down one day, visit the campus there. You'll see the church building where I'll be pastoring. You'll see where we'll be living, and you can come out, and we can keep our fellowship growing. So on May the 26th, we headed for Keene, Texas. And as we were driving down the interstate out of Fort Worth toward Keene, Renee announced that we were going to stop by the union office and pick up a man by the name of John McFarland. We call him Jack. He said he worked at the union office. And I'm thinking to myself, union office, union office, union office. What is a union office? Is this man involved in some kind of labor disputes? <laughs> what is a union office? <laughs> well, by the time we got there, I knew what a union office was. And, and Jack McFarlane had been a Presbyterian minister who is now a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And he was working with ministers in the Southwest Union who had an interest in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian church. And when I was introduced to Jack McFarlane, he did not simply extend a hand in my direction. 
He threw those long arms around about me, drew me close to his chest, and I whispered, wow, another Seventh-day Adventist Christian on the face of this earth. We visited the campus. Renee took me into the church building where he would be ministering. Sanctuary that would seat over a thousand people at one time. And I walked right down the center aisle, walked up on the platform, stood behind the pulpit, looked out across the empty pews, and I thought to myself, hmm, I sure would like to preach in this church one day. We went home that evening. The next morning, I'm in my church study. The telephone rings, and the voice on the other end cheerfully says, Good morning, this is Jack. And I said, Jack who? He said, Jack McFarlane. And I said, Oh, Jack, it's good to hear from you. And we talked about the previous day. And then Jack became silent for a few moments. And then he said, Dan, I spent a good part of last night and this morning talking with Jesus. And God's Holy Spirit has impressed me to give you a call and extend to you an invitation to become a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And when those words touched my physical and spiritual eardrums, the tears began to roll down my cheeks, and I whispered, that's what I've been waiting for. On Memorial Day, we went to the camp meeting in Keene, and you'll have to excuse me. After all these years, I still get emotional when I share. But we went to camp meeting on Memorial Day, and I found Jack, and I told him that I accepted his invitation. On June the 11th and June the 22nd, I met with the brethren of the Texas Conference in the Southwest Union, and they asked me all kinds of questions, and I responded to them. And at the end of that second meeting, they gave me an official invitation to become a minister in the Texas Conference and announced if I accepted their invitation, I would be placed on the pastoral staff in Keene, Texas. And when they made that announcement, I understood why a few weeks before I'd been praising God for Renee Keys me going out of my life because he wasn't going out at all. In fact, God was just leading him to the very church to be my personal pastor where God wanted me to begin my ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church. On Monday morning, July the 12th, I met with the other four pastors to become the fifth pastor of that pastoral staff to learn my privileges, duties, responsibilities. And then on Sabbath, July the 17th, my wife and I were baptized by Pastor Renee Keesby into the remnant family of God. After the baptism, there were a lot of doors in that church, and I was standing at one of the doors greeting people as they left. And I can close my eyes now, and I can still see the elderly lady as she's walking in my direction, and she's shaking her head in this direction. She walked up to me, and I'm going to try to express to you exactly what she said and the way she said it as she's shaking her head back and forth. Pastor Dan, we have never in all the history of this denomination ever heard of anybody being placed on a pastoral staff before they were baptized. <laughs> and I placed my hand on her shoulder and I said, but my sister, you don't understand that all of my life, God has been leading me to this very moment. She gave me a great big hug, and she said, Welcome home, Pastor Dan. Welcome home. 
I found a people. Yes, there is a people. And by God's grace, through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, we are going to overcome. We are going to finish our course with victory. And we are going to hear him say to us, well done, soon and very soon. After that baptism experience, I discovered much to my dismay that the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church is not a perfect church. As my wife sings sometimes, God's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make all these moon and soon stars, but he's still working on me, and he's still working on you. But we're going to overcome. We're going to overcome. May I say it one more time? We are going to overcome. Yes, Several years later, I was preaching at the Central California Camp Meeting, and one of the leaders came to me when, after one session, and he had heard a part of my testimony, and he had this puzzled expression on his face. And he asked, Dan, would you tell me what you are? And at first it caught me a little off guard, but then I realized what he was saying. And so I placed my arm around his shoulder, and I said, my brother, first of all, I want you to understand that I am a Christian. Because my Bible says, unless we're born again, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Secondly, my brother, I am a Baptist Christian. Because I believe that after a person accepts Jesus as their personal Savior, they ought to be dipped just as deep as they can be ducked, come up walking in newness of life, serving him not only as Savior, but also as Lord of their life. Next, my brother, I'm a holiness Baptist Christian. Because my Bible says that we are to be a peculiar people, and God has not called us to look like the world. God hasn't called us to talk like the world. God hasn't called us to eat and drink like the world. God has called us to be a different kind of people, not for the purpose of just being different, but different so that we can radiate the majesty of God's grace in our lives. Next, my brother, I'm a Pentecostal holiness Baptist Christian. Because I believe if they needed the baptism of God's Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost for the church to be birthed in a blaze of glory, we need the same baptism of God's Holy Spirit in our lives if the church is going to go out in a blaze of glory. Next, my brother, I am a Lutheran, Pentecostal, holiness, Baptist Christian. Because Martin Luther was used by God to bring about a revival of the just shall live by faith. And my heart's desire is that the faith of Jesus will be my faith. Next, my brother, I am a Seventh-day Lutheran, Pentecostal, Holiness, Baptist Christian. Because I have discovered from a study of God's Word that the Seventh-day Sabbath is binding for time, and we're going to celebrate it in all of eternity. Next, my brother, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Holiness, Baptist, Christian, because Adventists are looking forward to the coming of the Lord, and my heart's cry is, even so come quickly, my Redeemer. And finally, my brother, I am a Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist, Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostal, Holiness, Christian. And when I said Catholic, his lower jaw dropped. And I asked, you know what Catholic means, don't you? And he said, yes universal. And I said, that's right. And I'm just foolish enough to believe if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for the whole world. He asked, what are you again? <laughs> and I went through it. And when I finished, he started yelling at the top of the lungs, and you could hear it reverberating across that camp meeting. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to be. God's calling us. God's calling you. And God's calling me to a place of total surrender to Him. God is calling us to experience an overcoming mentality. Are you willing? 
to meet God's call and summon in that direction. Father God, how we thank you for the way that you lead and guide in our lives. And Father, I pray if there is one who has heard this testimony message who has not yet allowed you to become leader and guider so that he or she might become an overcomer through your grace. May your spirit speak even now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Father, we pause to offer ourselves afresh and anew to you right now, thanking you for the yesterdays, for the todays, and for the tomorrows, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are willing and capable of leading us and guiding us for your name's sake. Because when everything is said and done, it's all about vindicating your name. So, Father, I am praying for myself and for my brothers and my sisters that your sweet Holy Spirit will empower our testimonies like never before. That the words we say and the ways in which we say them will cause men and women and young people to look to Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith as you are of our faith. Father, there's so many people who need to understand that overcoming is not only a possibility, it can be a reality as we place our hand in your hand to be led all the way to a better land. Because this prayer, I pray, and praises for victories I give in the overcoming name of Jesus. And all the Lord's children say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan Gerard. What a wonderful, powerful message tonight. I want to tell you that uh, I received a text from our Good News TV director, Luke Skelton, and said that we may have as many as 700 people watching online. Praise the Lord. A lot of people touched by that. One of them is a good friend of mine who texted me. He's the undersecretary of the North American Division, Eldon Ramirez, said, what a powerful message, Elder Gerard. Thank you for your message tonight. Just want to share with you real quick our program for tomorrow. We don't want anyone to miss any part of it. We're going to have a fabulous program. Uh, and we want to thank the host church here at Seventh-day Adventist Church in Phoenix. Uh, for doing a wonderful job with the music, with the sound, with everything, and we really appreciate uh, your willingness to host us. Tomorrow, 9.30 sharp, we're going to have a Sabbath school presentation. Our education director, Nicole uh, Matson, put together a beautiful program for you, some great testimonies. You do not want to miss that. You want to be here at 9.30 online. Uh, virtual, uh, mygoodnewstv.com, whether you look at YouTube, Facebook, or whatever venue you want to use to get on there, get on there so you'll be a part of that. Our worship program will begin at 11 a.m. And then Scott Michael Bennett, who gave us the beautiful music tonight, touched my heart, I can tell you that, and you always have, brother. Uh, he will be doing a concert at 545. So 545, you'll want to be online to be a part of that concert. And then our final program for this first weekend at 7 o'clock tomorrow night as Dr. Dan Gerard will lead us one more time uh, to the throne of grace. We are so grateful for each one of you being here and for all of you who are watching online. Be with us again tomorrow. Remember that special passage of scripture they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Revelation 12, 11. Think on those words as you sleep tonight and as you pray and become a part of our service tomorrow as well. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. Hi, I'm Luke Skelton, General Manager for Good News TV. 
It has been our honor to bring the virtual camp meeting experience to you via live stream on our website, Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. If you would like to obtain any DVDs of the powerful messages you have seen, or if you have any questions about camp meeting, please give us a call. It is the mission of Good News TV to spread the love of Jesus Christ and the truths of His Word, as well as connecting viewers with a local church family. We broadcast Christ-centered messages of hope 24 hours a day on seven TV stations throughout Arizona in both English and Spanish. Please help us with our mission by giving generously to this ministry. To donate, please visit our website at mygoodnewstv.com or give us a call at 480-264-1116. Thank you for your participation in this year's virtual camp meeting, and thank you for your prayers and support of this media outreach ministry. God bless you. My name is uh, Jimmy Greco, and my ability to be a creative person uh, I try to do the best that I can to glorify God through my artwork. I'm originally from New York, uh, grew up on Long Island, uh, moved here in 2000 to Phoenix, Arizona. I now make this my home. I am a member now of the Glendale Adventist Church. Uh, just past Sabbath, I was baptized, and I'm very happy to be a member of the family. And the Three Angels Broadcasting Network. <laughs> and my original design for my painting that I did. And this is a painting I did inspired by the um, symbol that's on my church, the Bible opening up, the Holy Spirit coming up, and uh, giving the message of the three angels upon the earth. And uh, that's what's inspired me to do this painting. The story of my life begins uh, in Mexico City where I was uh, born. Uh, my natural parents gave me up for adoption. There was this elderly couple searching first uh, children to, that they wanted to adopt because they were too old to have their own. I guess my natural parents had given me over to the Roman Catholic Church for adoption. Uh, my adopted parents brought me to New York where they uh, made their home. I grew up on Long Island. I uh, went to Catholic school, Catholic boarding school, was raised Roman Catholic. Um, so I was introduced to God pretty much that way. Um, through my lifetime, I kind of put my faith in God, I guess from that point on, because I knew He had His hand on me since I was born. Um, I've gone through many things in my lifetime. My mother died when I was five. My father pretty much uh, raised me. Um, when I left my father, I went out to go um, pretty much discover the world on my own. I've had times to where I had an alcohol problem when I was young. I started drinking as a teenager. Um, in the military, I went on to doing drugs. I spent three and a half years on a psych ward at the VA hospital after I got out of the Navy. I had done uh, some, some major drugs when I was in the service. I had spent time homeless in New York. Being homeless in New York City is, uh, you would need God to uh, walk the streets in New York, the coldness, uh, and um, you would have to, I had to rely on God to take me through that journey to, to help give me the strength to, uh, to endure this. I also, uh, at one time, in one of my tribulations here in Arizona, I was in jail for two weeks um, because I did not complete an anger management course for domestic violence that I had endured. And uh, where if it was not for Christ helping me make it through that and, and giving me the strength to endure that, that um, I don't know if I could have made that. Certain events in my life that um, like people dying, um, I've lost my father, my mother, my sister, my wife, my best friend, my first girlfriend. I've lost at least one person every 10 years. Instead of being bitter, um, God's giving me the strength to, to, uh, to go through it and to, uh, to just to deal with it the best way that I can and not feel bitter. Coming more to where we are today, I live here in Phoenix, Arizona. 
Um, I started watching Good News Television, and um, it opened my eyes to some things that really spoke to my heart. I used to go to other churches, not to say there's anything wrong with those churches or, or the denominations, but they weren't answering my questions. I had questions that you could read in the Bible, but they weren't covering and they would leave that out like the Sabbath or, or uh, where we are in Revelations. And, and I found that when I started watching like good news TV, which led me to go to other television uh, programming like uh, Amazing Facts or 3ABN, um, I got to see more and more that spoke more to my heart to where one day I actually just looked up which was the nearest Adventist um, church in my area. And I've been going there for a little less than a year. Jesus reply, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My, my teaching, my Father will love them and we will come to them and make them awesome. I love the people in the church. Uh, they've been really warm and loving and, and caring and, and real. And I think that's what really got my attention to being an Adventist is that when I heard the messages, everything spoke to my heart and it, it was true and it was real and I could identify with it. And it was down to earth and there was no fluff. There was no Hollywood type magic behind it. It was as genuine as you can get. And that's what I've been searching for and it called my heart to join that church because the other churches, not that there was anything wrong with that, but they left me empty and incomplete. And on this journey, I needed to know more of the truth. And, and hearing the messages off of Good News Television and some of the other broadcasts, it got me to thinking, I'm like, wow, this is some real stuff. And um, it made me look and try to get more involved with it. And I knew that I needed a church to become a member of a family of God's family, because I know it's very important to have support. When I was five years old, God blessed me with a talent um, to draw and to, um, to sketch and to paint. And I've been very thankful for that talent that God's given me. Um, 60, and I've been doing it since I was five. Um, this is how I pray to God. This is how I give God glory through my artwork for His will, because it's not my will. I'm just trying to do what I hope He would have me do. That's His plan for me. and just to bring glory to him and to his kingdom. What greater artist on earth or in the universe than there is God Almighty in heaven. Every day that uh, I wake up and see the uh, sunrise and the sunset, uh, that pretty much tells me how great an artist God is. Uh, it touches me. I mean, I can never be anything like God as an artist, but uh, it definitely tells me how great he is as a creator. Um, um, yeah, it touches my life, and he's he's been with me uh, my whole life in uh, in my ability to be a creative person. Uh, I try to do the best that I can to glorify God through my artwork. Uh, that's how I give him praise. Uh, he's led me to this point to where I'm at now who I can continue to grow, it's like a tree. Well, God put me in the right ground. He gave me the right nourishment. I think it's now time to bear fruit. So, and sometimes it takes a lifetime before you can bear fruit. So, hopefully that's the stage that I'm at now. <laughs> People should support Good News TV because um, it offers hope. Many of you have been blessed by the messages from Pastor Doug Batchelor that you've seen on Good News TV. As Pastor Doug says, anyone who even glances at the end time prophecies and signs of the second coming can see that our world is literally plunging chaotically toward the end of time. Yet those who believe in scripture can live in peace through stormy times that we're experiencing because we know the end of the story. To encourage and strengthen you for the times ahead, Good News TV is offering you a free copy 
of the Final Events of Bible Prophecy magazine. It's a captivating, colorful, and biblically accurate resource that will equip you to share the good news of Jesus' soon return. From this magazine, you'll learn what the Bible really teaches about last day events, such as the rapture, the millennium, the second coming, and much more. So for your free copy, give us a call. Jesus is pure.